invocation for peace. So, Prerna, Priyanka, is it Prerna? G sir, Priyanka. Priyanka, sorry. Okay. तीन ओमकार के साथ शुरू करते हैं. सहनो भुनक्तो सह वीर्यम करवावहे तेजस्विना वदीतमस्तु मा विद्विशावहे ओम शांति 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 ही थैंक यू थैंक यू प्रियंका सो लेट मी बिगिन विद अ वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू Uh, to this uh, uh, lecture today by ambassador venkatesh varma and i want to thank uh, uh, venkatesh for uh, uh, being with us today and uh, uh, sharing his uh, views on russia ukraine uh, uh, war which is going on as we speak uh, it is perhaps uh, the Uh, arguably the most uh, serious uh, geopolitical crisis that uh, the world has uh, faced uh, since the uh, end of the cold war and uh, what its ramifications and implications are uh, in the near medium and long term future is a matter of uh, conjecture and guess at this moment but there is no doubt that uh, the impact is going to be uh very serious uh the world order is uh, likely to be restructured uh, new power equations uh, which were already emerging uh in the last uh, 20 years or so uh these uh, will uh, be uh, catalyzed and uh, the crisis that is uh, the war that is happening today is uh, in the heart of europe and this is also perhaps uh, the uh, nato's uh, biggest uh, security challenge uh, during the cold war uh, they didn't have to uh, face uh, uh, russia or soviet union at that time uh, militarily but now uh, the war is uh, right uh, at the peripheries of uh, nato uh, the reasons uh, for this uh, have been discussed and i think uh, are well known uh, to uh, the people who have gathered here today but uh, surely ambassador venkatesh verma uh, would be uh, dwelling uh, upon them uh, india is also very deeply impacted there are both direct and indirect uh, consequences for our uh, security uh, uh, there are uh, secondary benefits as well as uh, secondary implications as well particularly uh, playing through the you know, e- economy and also uh, the disruption of supply chains etc uh, there is also this uh, whole uh, uh, issue of uh, uh, the regional impacts which will uh, ripple through and uh, there is also this question of the impact on russia itself uh, russia china relations uh, the uh, relationship between um, the us and russia the future of russia future of putin i think there are many many uh, questions of that nature which have uh, arisen and at this uh, point when the you know, war is just about uh, in the initial stages uh, we can only uh, speculate uh, and uh, guess uh, at the same time i think uh, there are also implications for the nature of warfare itself what kind of a war is it uh, of course there have been wars and wars and uh, people have analyzed them but uh, this uh, seems to be a, a far more comprehensive war uh, what we we call uh, Uh, the hybrid war so what exactly does it mean and uh, how is it playing out so i think there are many questions of that nature uh, which uh, ambassador venkatesh varma will uh, perhaps uh, uh, dwell upon uh, briefly uh, in, i would like to introduce uh, ambassador venkatesh varma uh, 
Uh, he is uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, very bright diplomats, a very uh, efficient, well-known diplomats, uh, who has, uh, who till recently was uh, our ambassador uh, Russia, and he retired a few months ago. So he's very fresh uh, from uh, uh, from his uh, dealings. Uh, with the top Russian uh, leadership and also the Russian uh, people. So he has uh, insights. He has the advantage of the, that insight which many of us uh, do not have. Uh, that is uh, not the only uh, uh, quality Ambassador Venkatesh has. He has uh, uh, been uh, associated uh, with the disarmament issues and multilateral issues for uh, decades uh, as a part of uh, his career in uh, the Indian Foreign Service. Uh, he was uh, our uh, ambassador to uh, permanent representative to the uh, conference on disarmament at uh, Geneva, where he has dealt with the disarmament issues uh, quite intimately. So he's very familiar with international security issues. He was also a GS disarmament, and in that capacity, he uh, was in charge of India's uh, disarmament uh, policy. Uh, he has also been involved uh, with the uh, civil uh, nuclear cooperation that India has forged over the last several uh, years. So he has uh, intimate uh, knowledge uh, about that. Uh, so we were uh, most uh, grateful to Ambassador Venkatesh Verma for uh, agreeing to our invitation to uh, be with us today at this Vimarsh uh, uh, forum. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Venkatesh, and we look forward to your uh, uh, talk. So you could perhaps uh, uh, speak uh, for about 45, 50 minutes, and maybe then take some uh, questions. Uh, this is an open forum, so uh, there are many people who would be interested from the general public, and maybe even media, who would be interested in uh, uh, listening to uh, you. And I also want to thank uh, some very eminent uh, uh, people who have uh, today uh, come to listen to you. and. Uh, I don't want to name all of them. Some of them are already visible. Uh, but I also see Ambassador uh, Savitri Kunadi. I also saw her. Uh, she's also there. Uh, this is, uh, I think, probably one of the few times that sh she has here. So welcome, uh, madam. And uh, then Ambassador Bene Pradhan from Tanzania has also uh, joined us. Uh, thank you, uh, Bene. And of course, uh, there are very other regulars, General Vijay is there, Ravi Sani, Ambassador Rajagopal, and, and many others. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. So now I request uh, Ambassador Venkatesh Verma to kindly share his views. So <clears throat> good evening, and uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to speak at uh, this forum, uh, of the uh, this very prestigious forum run by the uh, Vivekananda International Foundation. And, so to you, sir, particularly, uh, thank you very much. We uh, go back a very long time. Uh, I was a very junior officer at, in Moscow when you were looking after the Russia desk in uh, in Delhi. And, uh, you know, from then on, you've been, uh, your, uh, your professionalism has always been an inspiration uh, to us. And I'd like to thank all our senior colleagues who've joined us today. And of course, my, my partner, uh, from Moscow, who was the deputy chief of mission uh, for for three years, Vinay uh, Pradhan, who's who's joining us. Uh, you know, once you get Russia into your blood, it's very difficult to take it out. You know, so I think uh, that's the reason. Is so. Um, firstly, I think it's uh, it's not an easy task uh, in terms of clarity to speak about an ongoing war, and I think the the Shanti Mantra that was. Uh, read out at the beginning of this is a, a reminder of the responsibility that bears on all of us uh, who deal with re matters relating to war, that we should take it with the utmost responsibility and uh, and clarity of mind. Of course, one good thing that is uh, we can be quite uh, relieved and, and in fact proud about is the fact that uh, almost all our Indian nationals have, have have been uh, have been evacuated, uh, particularly our Indian students. Uh, you know, uh, the, the country was very worried for a, a couple of uh, weeks uh, on the fate of the students. And this uh, 
uh, evacuation operation Ganga that was done, I think is quite unique because, uh, you know, we've done evacuations in the past, uh, you know, Yemen, Libya, Kuwait, but I do not recall a, uh, a similar evacuation where we've had to extract Indian nationals, in this case, uh, more than 700 students from an active war zone, active war zone. Uh, you know, even in Libya, we, we got them out of uh, areas which were on the periphery of an active conflict zone. Uh, in Yemen, uh, we extracted them of a, of a general conflict zone, but uh, Sumi, where this uh, 700 kids were, where was an active. Uh, and I think it was possible only because that uh, we were able to influence Russian military operations at the highest level. And that in turn was possible because of the personal rapport that uh, so happily exists between Prime Minister Modi and President Putin. I can't think of another way of having accomplished the same objective of actually moderating and uh, 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 an ongoing military operation because you need to extract your own students from a war zone. So I think it shows both the, uh, the, the, the critical nature of the threat that was faced and the manner in which it was solved. Uh, I think is, uh, I mean, it is a very uh, special quality of the relationship that exists between um, our Prime Minister and uh, President Putin, and the special quality of the relationship with, uh, you know, with Russia. So let me basically say what is happening now. Uh, step back a bit and say how did we reach this place, uh, this stage in the conflict, and then draw as the title of the of your of the talk you have asked me to give is what are the strategic trends and what is what is the impact on India and I'll do that towards the second half of my presentation. So uh, you know we've all been following this uh, um, on uh, from afar. Um, you know the ongoing uh, military uh, operations of Russia, which started in bright earnest in 24th of February. So we are almost uh, two weeks or fortnight into these operations. Now, the broad picture that emerges is the following. There are basically four fronts that the Russians are fighting on. And almost all the four fronts have different objectives. Of course, the official justification for Russia to go in into, um, into, in, into Ukraine on the 24th of February was denazification and demilitarization. Uh, we'll, we'll hold that thought for a moment, but let us look at the evidence on the ground. There is the Eastern Front, uh, Kharkiv Plus, in the Donbass area, where uh, the Russian forces, regular Russian forces, along with the forces that were already there in uh, in, uh, in Donetsk and uh, Luhansk, uh, the, the paramilitaries or the forces of the DPR and the LPR, are facing the largest concentration of Ukrainian troops in Ukraine. The largest concentration of Ukrainian troops are not around Kyiv. They were and still are in Donbas. Number one. Now, Kharkiv, they've made some progress. They've done, done some uh, flanking activity. Uh, so the Eastern sector, which is, I think, which has the potential for either a frontal uh, combat between the mass of uh, Russian forces and the mass of Ukrainian forces. And those battles are still to be joined in a very major way. So that is the Eastern Front. And then the Southern Front, which is uh, in the sea that comes up from uh, uh, Mikolaev, uh, right up, it goes up to Kharkiv. Zaporozhnaya, and it goes up. The Russians have very specific military objectives. And we might ask if the West makes it out to be that the idea is to get to Kyiv and dispose of, uh, do a regime change in, in Kyiv, why is it that the Russians are doing so much in the south from Crimea upwards? The reason that they're doing it is because one of the primary aims of Russian military intervention or invasion, as you might call it, into Ukraine 
was to stem and stop, destroy substantial NATO level military facilities that were coming up in the Black Sea area. Mariupol to begin with, and probably we'll see some military activity in Odessa. They have not yet opened up the Odessa front, but between uh, Mikolaev and Mariupol, they have taken Mariupol. Uh, they will either cart away or destroy NATO level, which is the best in the world, intelligence, communication, naval equipment that was being installed in that area. Okay, this is the southern front. And how these two uh, access uh, uh, work out, we'll see what will happen in the in the in the deepener uh, you know uh, city. You know whether they will come in from uh, the flanking operations will come from uh, the eastern front or from the southern front, but that is the next update. The third, of course, where the entire international attention is placed is in the north, and there Russian forces have come in through Belarus. And uh, if we go back and step back and see when these deployments were taking place, you we, we would remember that uh, in eastern, uh, in western Russia, the, the southwest military district, the current forces that have gone into the eastern uh, uh, region of Ukraine have been there on exercise since December. But the Russian forces which have gone into Kyiv have come through Belarus you know, fairly, uh, fairly, you know, they came around mid January or so. So, this Kiev dimension is an additionality, or it is an, a new thing that has been put in. Uh, not new in the sense, it was a later addition to the overall activity. Now, with Kyiv itself, there are two two thrusts: one on the on the eastern side, one on the western side. Uh, the eastern side one is making a little more progress. They are almost on the on the uh, on the outskirts of of Kyiv. Uh, whether they will do a frontal assault on Kyiv, whether they will go down, uh, connect uh, below uh, the southern part of Kyiv, and then sort of uh, Sort of strangulate Kiev uh, and surround Kiev and and undertake uh, military activity that they have taken on other uh, big uh, urban centers in uh, in eastern Ukraine. We will we'll wait and see. The last military activity is in the Western Front, and that has opened up very recently, and that is not for physical occupation of Western Ukraine, where there are almost no troops there. But it is uh, the supply lines for uh, an almost a flood, a tornado of NATO, American, Western equipment, fighters uh, that are going to flood in, that are flooding into Ukraine. Now, if you were a military, if you see it from the military perspective, and you ask the question, where is the center? of gravity of this battle, the political center of gravity of this battle, there is there are four. And not all are of equal uh, nature or of similar nature. So this notion that Russia has been said, you know, the Russians wanted Zelensky's surrender in the first two weeks, they lost uh, a thing, is partly true, partly true. I mean, in the sense, they went into Kyiv, uh, in the area around Kyiv, they met resistance, their progress has been slow, but their objective has not been abandoned. But that is very different from the encirclement and the annihilation of the substantive number of Ukrainian military forces in eastern Ukraine, which is the Donbas area. And which is again very different from the southern military operations that the Russians taking place. So if we add all this up, what is the first conclusion that we can draw on whatever the nature of military activity, whether the Russians succeed, get bogged down, they lose, three or four different things will happen. One is the northern fire is on its own track. 
and for that they have kept the russians have kept the door open for dialogue they have had uh, three rounds face to face with the ukrainians themselves uh, they have kept the lines open to president macron or some of the europeans who are willing to talk putin hosted bennett from israel um the turks said please come to antalya they had there was a foreign minister meeting in antalya and the meeting between uh, the nsa of the united states and the chinese counterpart in rome today is also part of the process because this is this is uh, compelling uh, a two track process of military operations taking place along with uh, the diplomatic dialogue presently there is no progress in the diplomatic dialogue because on each front each country each side is drawing its own conclusion the russians have done extremely well on the southern front relatively speaking there is almost a stalemate on the northern front with kiev the battle for the eastern front where the maximum number of forces are deployed is still to be joined the day the ukrainian forces are either encircled or uh, uh encircled or uh, cut across and bypass uh the rest of the russian forces will rush to kiev but where it will leave uh, um, ukraine is very clear the southern part of ukraine will be under some form of russian occupation or control for the foreseeable future they have not gone to moripol and will not get into odessa to give it up unless they lose completely which is unlikely the no, the kiev operation is negotiable and the russians are making it very clear they got got in you know 40 km of a convoy they kept them waiting they they sent in um, uh, they they sent in forces uh, they are talking at the same time now so this is broadly the military situation but this is a war in ukraine but it is a global conflict it is a global conflict because it is russia versus the west by uh, by targets and by instrumentalities because there are essentially the war is being fought on four dimensions and as ambassador Uh, Gupta mentioned uh, it is a hybrid war, but there are four identifiable dimensions. One is the dimension on the ground, which is the military forces, which you know we are all familiar with. This is how normally wars are fought. But there is an information war dimension, uh, which is global, uh, and which the Ukrainians are winning hands down, probably nine one on ten zero. Uh, Uh, last, firstly, the Russians are very bad at information war. Secondly, I don't think they care. Uh, thirdly, they are also stunned by the full panoply of what an information war means. In our perspective, we think that content is information war. There, you know, false propaganda, negative propaganda. The current war is shown. that everybody is called to participate in an information war which is all the news channels the the media uh, uh, the social media youtube uh, twitter everyone you can't russia has become silent in the world because the west has cut <laughs> cut the links russia is non existent and according to the war that has been fought on twitter uh, and on social media and tiktok and all you know the the ukrainians have won and it's just a matter of sending the russians back home there's a very very important dimension the second the third dimension is cyber warfare there have been some skirmishes on both sides but the important le- uh, lesson that we can draw presently conclusion we can draw is that neither side has drawn out the big firepower on the cyber front they have done a little bit on banks they have done a little bit on websites they have done a little bit on media but the big disruptive force has uh, has still not come and both sides uh, you know both the united states and russia are hugely um, 
you know, very powerful in this dimension, but they have been held back. Either they have been held back for the right timing, or they're being held back because of good defenses, which is unlikely because, you know, as of today, uh, the good uh, deterrence for cyber is good offense because there are no substantial defense that, uh, you know, that neither. The fourth, of course, is the economic damage, which, of course, has absolutely stunned the world. The economic dimension is the weaponization of finance and globalization. Now, this has been in play for several years. You know, we've seen small Ranji Trophy games uh, of economic uh, um, things with Iran, with uh, North Korea, you know, bits and pieces. We've, we've seen the, the power of economic sanctions. But this is not Ranji Trophy. This is not Dilip Trophy. This is complete test match, top class test match. And what has happened? here is that there is, of course, an asymmetry in, uh, in capabilities and vulnerabilities. And the vulnerable part is the Russian Federation, which has, uh, like India, 30 years of engagement with, the, with globalization and has acquired over a period of time all the strengths and weaknesses of globalization, which is external dependence, you know, uh, faith in uh, international uh, structures and things like that. You know, we'll we'll discuss that a little later. What is surprising is that the Brahmastra that the United States wish to use use they used it, which is uh, sanctions. Uh, you know, freezing the assets of the central bank, cutting off SWIFT, uh, cutting off the airspace, uh, uh, asking Western companies to pull out of Russia. Uh, the information war, uh, the the uh, the uh, the vilification of Putin pers personally, uh, and you have the rest of the thing. Now, this Brahmastra has been used very early, and there are you know the the big the big uh, firepower sanctions have already been used. The, the smaller firepower sanctions are the following. Which is they've kept the open, kept open the door for, uh, for energy. Uh, United States, Canada, and UK themselves have said uh, we will not buy Russian oil. Uh, Forty-five days to taper it off. But Europe is still being allowed to. So there is no oil embargo of the nature that was imposed on Iran. But of course, doing business with Russia in the energy field is far more complicated now than it was, say, uh, say two weeks two weeks ago. But what they have also unleashed with the specific purpose of destabilization of the Russian economic and political system, for economic system to the in the expectation that the political system will also unravel. Every day that the two spin cells around Kiev do not are not able to enter key. And every day Zelensky gets, he lives another day and his survivability increases. Every day that these sanctions do not create social and political instability in Russia, President Putin gets more and more space because over a period of time, it is of declining utility. I mean, you, 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 you hit them hard first. So it is quite interesting why the Americans chose not to escalate gradually into higher and higher forms of economic coercion, but they went right up to the top in the, almost in the first go itself. Now, that can be based on the calculation that, uh, uh, you know, this is a blow that, uh, that Russia cannot take. Uh, this is a blow that will set people onto the streets. Um, this is a blow that will bring down the ruble, crash the ruble into 150, 200, uh, get inflation in, and inflation, as we all know, is uh, is a giant political killer. Uh, and you collapse the uh, the Russian economy, and the entire uh, edifice falls on the political leadership, and the political leadership then sues for peace. You know. 
and putting it in layman terms, this is what what what, what is there. So, what are the big two unutilized uh, levers that are still there, which have not been used? Cyber is one. Uh, energy embargo, total embargo, global embargo is another. Forcing and tripping up Russia to default on its sovereign debt is the third. We are not yet going to space and nuclear because, you know, uh, I, I don't think we've reached a, a level of a close combat on either side where both sides would escalate to, uh, to, to, to interfering with each other's uh, space and, and, and nuclear assets. Of course, President Putin has responded to uh, quite a bit of saber rattling from the Western side on on making some uh, some comments on, but I think those two levers are still there. So how how do we how do we add it up? There is a four 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 axis uh, military campaign in uh, in in Ukraine. There are several levels of escalation that are taking place but several levels of escalation that are potential and could be used in the future. So the overall potential for escalation of this conflict is still very, very high. Still very, very high. I mean, we can console ourselves by saying it's just the beginning of, uh, of the conflict, but we can also draw some conclusions from the fact that neither side, you see, both sides are defining their political objectives in almost absolutist terms. When political objectives are defined in absolutist terms, military means can never sort of catch up, catch up to you know what is being asked. So you have uh, you have two dimensions of escalation where the two levels of escalation are not talking to each other. So uh, the the Russians will escalate in terms of firepower in Ukraine. Uh, the Americans will escalate in you know giving them javelin plus uh, things you know foreign fighters coming in into Ukraine um, and the rest, I mean, and the Russians will respond. But there is also this larger global confrontation that has now uh, been locked in. I mean, and uh, this locking in of global confrontation, uh, you know, as I wrote in my uh, Economic Times uh, piece, I said it is a conflict which is slowly becoming a crusade. Crusade is, where you involve whole societies, you ask everyone to make a sacrifice. You know, it's not just combatants or non-combatants, it's not just people in the field who are fighting. You know, everybody is a warrior. And you see the Western media support on Ukraine. I mean, it is almost the entire West civilization has mobilized to support Ukraine. Now, when you have that level of mobilization, you know, uh, compromises are, uh, you know, become, you know, all the more difficult, you know, it's it's not that they are impossible. But my own sense is that if while the conflict has been fought at various levels, and it's a global conflict, the key determining critical factor will, of course, be the uh, 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 the military situation on the, on the ground. So let me step back for about a couple of minutes to say how did we reach this, you know, this place and uh, you know, uh, Russians and Ukrainians are uh, are close but distinct people. Uh, you know, they are intertwined people. Um, you know, they come from a same historical experience, uh, and they, you know, they were all part of. You know, they came come from the same roots of Christianity. Their uh, their language is pretty similar. I mean, as a Telugu, if I don't know a single, I've not been taught a single word of Kannada. You know, I can understand uh, 60, 70 percent of Kannada. You know, similarly, if you are Russian, you can understand a lot what what Ukrainians and and vice versa. They had a similar experience of being under the Mongols. They had a similar experience of being. Uh, you know, under the Russian Tsarist Empire. Uh, Ukraine was free between an independent country between 1917 and 1921. It was overtaken by Ukrainian communists, the Bolsheviks, largely led by Ukrainians, 
who then incorporated the Soviet Ukrainian Republic into the larger Soviet Union. And they were part of the Soviet Union until 1991. And if you read the dramatic events of that period of how the collapse of the Soviet Union took place, the collapse of the Soviet Union took place not because of war. You know, uh, in history, the redistribution of territory and power has happened almost always through uh, conflict. You know, you have to fight to get what you want. Ukraine became independent and so did Russia, the two big constituents of the Soviet Union, through a drunken conspiracy between President Yeltsin and uh, President Kravchuk, who decided amongst themselves that it was important to get rid of Gorbachev. So the disintegration of the Soviet Union was a joint conspiracy by Russia and Ukraine. And this is the circumstances on which Russia gained independence from the Soviet Union. And Ukraine gained independence from the Soviet Union. And it was always understood that while we will go our separate ways, we will have uh, a common intention to, to work together in a way that you would have your sovereignty and I would have my sovereignty, which is Russia and Ukraine. You know, so much is made about the 1994 uh, Budapest Memorandum. I mean, it is all very well for Ukrainians to say today, you know, first of all, the nuclear weapons on Ukrainian soil were not Ukrainian national property. Forget it. Even before the Russians could enter into a discussion on that, the Americans would have finished the Ukrainian soil. The 1994 Budapest Memorandum was entirely driven by the Americans. They were the keenest to get nuclear weapons out of Ukraine. They got the Russians in and the Brits in as, as co-signatories of the NPT so that the path would be cleared for the indefinite extension of the NPT in 1995 with Ukraine joining as a non-nuclear weapon state. And Ukraine was in no position to negotiate. And forget Ukraine, Russia was in no position to negotiate. If the Americans said at that point of time, there will be no we nuclear weapons in Ukraine, there will be no nuclear weapons in Ukraine. That was the nature of unipolar American uh, power at that point of time. So the, all this talk of saying, you know, we gave up our nuclear weapons, you know, we are now threatened today, is all theory. Because it doesn't correspond to reality. Now, Ukraine has always been a divided country. A divided country in the sense of Western Ukraine had very strong European orientation and Eastern Ukraine had very strong uh, Russian orientation. Until 2014, the most popular presidents in Ukraine were those presidents who campaigned on a slogan of openness to Europe and openness to Russia. Any president who said that I want to jump and run away and go off into the West got correspondingly less vote. That is true of Yanukovych, who was deposed of in 2014. That is true of President Zelensky. People forget that President Zelensky defeated President Poroshenko with a very wide margin because his original election campaign was that Poroshenko unnecessarily creates trouble with Russia. We need to live with both, with the European Union and with, uh, with Russia. And that was his initial, uh, and that was the uh, that was the election campaign on which he won. 2014 was a watershed, February 2014, because while Ukraine's uh, interest in membership of NATO predates 2014, it goes back to 2002. It was always an on and off uh, issue. But the Russians were always aware that the final destination of NATO expansion 
was Ukraine. It was not Macedonia. It was not Poland. It was not Hungary. It was not Slovenia. These are all extracurricular to get to the real prize of NATO expansion, which is Ukraine. Ambassador Strauss, who was American ambassador in uh, in uh, in Moscow in ninety one, when you know I was a young second secretary. He wrote in his cables to Washington, and it's there. Uh, they're all released, and it's also there in uh, Mary Sarotier's book. He hit the nail on the head in ninety one. He said, "All this is fine." NATO expansion is meaningful and most dangerous only if it includes Ukraine. And therefore, it was no surprise that systematically, in five rounds of uh, expansion, uh, NATO was expanded uh, and it came to the doorstep of Ukraine. In 2014, this thing changed. The entire public discourse is on whether to admit NATO or whether to admit Ukraine or not. A complete red herring. The real issue was that there was a change in tactics after 2014 because uh, give, given what the Russians did in Crimea and given the a uh, phony war that uh, that permanently descended onto eastern Ukraine, and the nature of the government that came in Kyiv, which completely left out this notion of having peace with Russia under Poroshenko. There was a systematic campaign of building up Ukrainian forces to NATO level. You don't have to be a NATO member to have NATO level forces. And that was what was systematically done, especially since 2016. And since 2016, um, the United States has given almost $2.7 billion worth of uh, military training and equipment. During Trump's time, they also gave javelin and things like that, and uh, things moved on. But more importantly, there were uh, NATO training teams uh, from UK, Canada, uh, Norway, uh, not Norway, some of the Scandinavian countries. And parallelly, the Turks were strengthening Ukrainian armed forces, again, training them to NATO levels on, on their training institutions. Secondly, the number of NATO exercises vis-a-vis -vis Russia between 2018 and 2021 increased 150 times. It reached the same level as NATO exercises during the height of the Cold War, which is Reagan's time, you know, 80, 86, 87. So the number of naval exercises in the Barren Sea and the Baltic Sea, and you would have seen instances where two B-52s would take off from UK. They would fly over the English Channel. They would fly over Germany. They would fly into Ukraine and 20 kilometers from the Ukraine and Russia border, they would turn around. So the Russians would see these two 252s coming. They would scramble their aircraft and the two 252s would turn around and go away. So the Russians also started doing this. They would send some of their, uh, you know, black jackers, black jacks, you know. That is, uh, you know, TU 95s and TU 160s into into the Baltic area, into into over you know over the English Channel. The Russians were doing the Northern Sea Fleet. Was, the Northern Fleet was doing an exercise in the in the Barents Sea. An American submarine that was from Norway pops up right in the middle of the Russian exercise area. Russians were stunned, embarrassed, uh, uh, suitably deterred. 
that happened that winter. So what the Russians did was that there was a postcard come in U.S. naval exercise in the Aleutian Islands, which is almost you know very close to California. The Russians did exactly the same. They sent a nuclear submarine, and right in the middle of the American exercise, the, the, the bugger came up and he surfaced. So this constant badgering that was taking place on both sides. Now, who began this thing is a matter of debate. I mean, you know, because it really doesn't materially change the situation that a Russia-NATO confrontation was building up in the Black Sea. And you, all of you remember the uh, British uh, ship that skirted into uh, Crimean waters on the grounds that Crimea is an illegal, uh, uh, Russia is an illegal occupation of Crimea and therefore it has no territorial waters vis-a-vis. -vis. We, we all remember this. Ukrainian militarization, pressure in the Black Sea, naval exercises, and all this combined with the fact that the Ukrainians had the largest deployment of their forces where? In Donbas. The largest deployment of Ukrainian forces are not protecting Kyiv. So this notion that the Russians, in a sense, intervene to make a bad situation worse, strategically. And it is not just about Ukraine. It is also about the Black Sea area. You see, Russia will shrink by half, as we learned from the time of Catherine the Great. If it has no, if it, if uh, Black Sea becomes uh, a NATO lake, and if the Baltic Sea is also removed, Russia will shrink and disappear. So the Russians are fighting, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, whether through the right means or not. But the threat that they are trying to address is this nature of threat. Now, whether Ukraine was willing to negotiate with Russia, I think the evidence on the ground shows that while the Minsk agreement was signed in 2014, uh, 2015, the willingness and incentive for the Ukrainians to negotiate and find a settlement of modus vivendi, which is that you have internal uh, autonomy for the two regions, and you, you know, Ukraine takes control over its external borders and protects its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia took the conclusion, came to the conclusion that this was a farce. The incentives for the Ukrainians to negotiate was decreasing because they were getting more and more military aid. They were increasing in their military strength, and therefore they would reach a stage where what they had in eastern Ukraine would also go. Quite apart from the pressure that they were feeling. Uh, you know they were uh, they were feeling in, uh, in in the Black Sea area. Now whether this is justified, whether this uh, this justifies the Russian invasion of um, of Ukraine, I don't know. Uh, there are strong views on both sides. Uh, crossing sovereignty and territorial integrity is a very big red line, and Russia did cross it. Uh, but in matters such as this. Uh, you know, uh, victory on the battlefield always provides its own justification. So if uh, Russia uh, loses the military war in Ukraine, it will be damned. If Russia had not fought this military war, it would have been damned in a, in a different sort of way. Whether being forced into a military situation like this is a sign of strength or weakness, I would say it's a sign of weakness of a big pass uh, that you don't get into situations where you have to resort to force uh, with your back to the wall. Now, the Western support for Ukraine was in the following manner. Between the IMF, World Bank, and the EU, Ukraine got $40 billion worth of loans from 2014. 40 billion, all sponsored by the Americans. The Americans gave 
military assistance of 2.7 billion dollars in uh, between 2017 and and now and just last two weeks the us congress has passed a, a, a ukraine support bill which is more than 10 billion dollars never has the united states congress ever passed in a single sitting assistance to a foreign country in terms of economic and military aid of the nature that it has passed for ukraine it has not happened with israel it has hap not happened with greece or turkey it has not happened with egypt and i can't think of any other closer allies it has not 100 percent not happened with pakistan 10 billion dollars in one go over a period of time you know pakistan has got 30 billion dollars uh, worth of support from the united states uh, between uh, 2001 and now but that is over almost a three decade period such is the nature of western commitment to ukraine so this is a fight of a fundamentally geopolitical nature this is real stuff this is not a skirmish this is not a war related to uh, to uh, to only to ukraine this has morphed into a conflict between russia and the west let me quickly turn to 10 strategic trends that i will list out uh, and then i'll conclude and then, uh, you know then we can have a discussion so the first is uh, the the, one, the the most obvious one uh, which i've been sort of repeating again and again is not just a war over ukraine but it is a global conflict between russia and the west and it's acquiring uh, dimensions of almost a crusade it is the first full-fledged hybrid war of the 21st century and i think our, um, our our seniors and our colleagues in the armed forces should study this and i'm sure they're doing it um, with uh, great uh, attention uh, because it is a uh, hybrid war is a multi-dimensional war it is not a, a hidden war anymore it's an open war and it is never confined to the battlefield the battlefield is now global so therefore you and you have the widest range of technologies you have uh, drones which travel fly at 10 kilometers an hour and the russians are threatening to use a circon missile which is mac 10 10 kilometers to mac 10 that is the range of equipment that is being brought to brought to bear in the uh, in the current uh, then we have discussed cyber info economic uh, warfare space and uh, and nuclear in the background now this conflict is also the third point the conflict is also involving whole societies you see we've had total wars in the past you know the german mobilization of the soviet mobilization in the second world war where total mobilizations of of of, of a very uh, very tough and very brutal nature but these are total mobilizations of a new type where everybody is expected to be part of this defense of ukraine where when did we hear the last time that nationals of a particular country at war were ostracized far away in you know different parts of the world it's happening today russian musicians being thrown out of the new york, new york philharmonic orchestra you know uh, uh, you know russian painters from one area uh, you know russian uh, uh, common citizens and if you look at twitter and social media I mean, you know, everybody is fighting over. I mean, they're all warriors, either in the information campaign or it's not, you know, it's not that people are joining in. It is that there is an expectation that you join, that you define the conflict in such total terms that, you know, you, you know, you would uh, be pushing your luck if you, if you, if you didn't have a, a, a say in this. The fourth is the open, blatant, brutal weaponization 
of networked interdependence. I mean, uh, there is no shyness about this. Uh, there is no uh, camouflaging. There is no justification. There is uh, a clear show of the formidable nature of how weaponized, how different parts of the globalized network can be weaponized. Uh, banking, financial, social media, uh, companies that have worked in Russia, uh, you know, Exxon Mobil, let me give you this and Binay, my good friend, uh, will bear me out. The Sakhalin One investment, which Ambassador Lamba, you know, pioneered, is India's most successful investment abroad ever. Money, what is the money you put in and what is the earnings you take out? There is no investment anywhere close by. ExxonMobil has been the operator of that thing and it also has a share. It works like poetry. I've had the uh, honor and privilege to accompany two of our ministers to that and you know, Binay accompanied us. It is poetry in action. It is perfect. Today, the United States is not importing oil from Russia. All the European countries are importing oil. And there is no easy substitute. So where is the need for ExxonMobil to withdraw from the circle in one site? When it is profitable, it is long-standing. There are other international partners, and there is no sanction. There is nothing in the sanctions thing that has been had issued in Washington asking that uh, oil companies will withdraw. So it's quite amazing how the sanctions are not just sanctions, but also voluntary nature and your social standing, commercial standing, your reputational standing is determined by how you relate to this. So you, in a sense, involve in your conflict almost everyone. It's a, it's a, it's a Hoover dimension of conflict. You know, you sort of suck up everyone that is on the way. The fifth is what we have, you know, beginning to learn. Interdependence is vulnerability. You know, Russians have learned it the, uh, the hard way. Uh, as I said, there were two, three big countries that went into globalization uh, in 1991. Um, you know, we are all, we are, we are, we are, the, we are the generation that grew up in, in, in the post-91 thing. Russia is being chopped off. And it is realizing that uh, everything from keeping money in the central bank outside your borders and to SWIFT to uh, booking uh, companies for your uh, airline tickets, everything is wonderful. You might own an uh, a a Apple phone, but you don't control the Apple phone. All the apps on the Apple phone can disappear uh, you know, in a day. So ownership is not control, is now wide and clear. It is the corollary of the willingness of the West to weaponize every aspect of interdependence. Which then takes us to the sixth point, where we are seeing the demise in practical action, not through analysis, of the concept of global commons and a rules-based international order. These were always fuzzy uh, concepts to begin with. But I think the current conflict is doing us the good favor of opening our eyes and showing us the world as it a really is. If you had asked us, is SWIFT a good global common? I mean, two months ago, we would have said, yes, of course it is. It's a small company in Belgium that good, does this good service to everyone in the world. Is having a visa or MasterCard a good global call? I mean, the ad for MasterCard said, don't leave home without it. You know, you'll be accepted anywhere in the world. 
you know, uh, getting McDonald's into the fight uh, into is, is a part of global commons. It is not. These are all finally companies, private companies that will listen to the diktat, political diktat of their governments. And if you ask me, rightly so. The fault is not theirs. I think the fault is, uh, you know, people like me who tend to believe that all this was for the common good. So I think it is a good uh, cleanser. You know, it's like an eye, eye cleaner, eye glasses cleaner that is coming up. So rules-based international order, I think the first rule of a rules-based international order is that might is right. And please don't depend on rules-based international order to protect your security interests, because there are none. And I think we should exercise a certain amount of uh, restraint in embracing Western concepts without fully understanding their uh, practical meaning. I think this is a good stage, a good time to, re to reinvest and think for ourselves. Uh, use concepts that are uh, that we understand, that we create and we understand, and we then put out into the world. This easy embrace, sometimes very lazy embrace, of concepts that come out from the West of global commons and a rule-based international order, I think we embrace only at our own peril. Inflation. The global dislocation in supply chains, energy, food, fertilizer, shipping, airlines, inflation is around the corner. And this will be, uh, this will be very, very major. During the COVID period, uh, different economies have pumped in $14 trillion worth of stimulus into the global economy, 14 trillion. 14. On top of that, we will get uh, a global energy price rise. A global energy price rise also not in terms of uh, taking out 8% 8, 8 of Russian oil and 6% of Russian gas outside the global economy. But also the fact that we've not the world has not invested in uh, new oil and gas resources. So if you want more uh, to produce more to uh, to bring down the price, there are not many fields left. Shale, if it's restarted in, in the US, will take about eight to 10 months to, to come on stream. So we are now, and quite apart from Russian and Ukrainian wheat and fertilizers and and uh, neon and palladium and uh, and uh, uh, nickel and aluminium and you know all this supply chain uh, breakages that are going to come we are looking at a giant political tidal wave of inflation that will sweep sweep across the world and inflation is a major political killer as we all know and countries wanting to take on inflation uh, tend to take measures that will only uh, create a global recession and mass unemployment. So a Ukraine conflict, no longer confined to Ukraine, acquires a conflict between Russia and the West, becomes a crusade, it leads to weaponization of global interdependence, interdependence with reckless abandon, unleashes forces that were not foreseen or those who unleashed these forces couldn't care less. And the targets and victims of this will, of course, be countries like India. The eighth point, the climate change agenda, I think, will go, will undergo a lot of change. Uh, Europe is already, the, the, the Americans are saying you, you cut off your dependence on energy on Russia. It is uh, how it's going to be done is, is not known. But what the Europeans will have to do is to restart coal, restart uh, uh, restart nuclear, uh, put in more, uh, you know, use their strategic reserves, 
by american shale oil and gas and lng ask the ask the middle east to to pump more oil and divert some energy uh, capacity from asia into europe that is the only way where you can win off uh, europe can win off uh, russia uh, dependence on russia by the end of the year La, uh, the ninth point unipolar europe has arrived under american leadership there were incipient green shoots of multipolarity in europe uh, between american uh, leadership and russian actions unipolarity has returned with a bang there is one european voice today and that is an american voice there is america has restored alliance discipline america america has restored uh, discipline with respect to energy and it will restore discipline with regard to defense and as long as the uh, european uh, the uh, the ukrainian quagmire continues in uh, in uh, in ukraine this is where america will put its main attention and resources on defense the total amount of um, uh, russian defense uh, expenditure is 80 billion dollars you know you put belarus and uh, at the rest nato which is united states plus uh, european countries is a trillion dollars 1 trillion this gap in military spending has brought us to this state just imagine with many european countries not even reaching the 2% mark 2% gdp mark now 2% gdp mark will now be uh, you know an yesterday stand we will soon see european countries and america spending far more on defense in uh, in nato how throwing more money at a flawed european security policy that is something that will play out in the future 10 and this is from our perspective the most important point the russia is tied down in this western flank i have explained to you black sea ukraine um, but russia also has a soft underbelly which is the entire central asian landmass and the entire central asian landmass still persists with mother ties to russia which is in terms of remittances in terms of employment for its youth in terms of subsidies in terms of uh, for their defense for their energy for their training russia collapses or becomes weak central asia will collapse to the ground central asia collapsing to the ground and we already have reports of uh, tajik kyrgyz and kazakhs leaving moscow or different parts of russia because they're not being paid or uh, they have a few dollars left and they want to go back to their uh, to their mother countries before the dollar before the ruble depreciates even more now we are looking at a gigantic political black hole that will appear right on on top of our uh, um, of of where we are now which is the country that is most well poised to take advantage of this uh, of this power power vacuum uh, that is emerging that also leads us to this most important point on the equation between russia and china in my view there is very little that china can do to help russia's predicament military predicament on the ground in ukraine very little but russia can make things very difficult for russia uh, china can make things very difficult for russia it has contracted uh, gas and oil supplies worth about about a 50 billion dollars a year 
Now, contracted oil and gas supplies to Europe are still continuing. But the, we might come to a stage where the Americans will up the ante and say, Europe, you, you cut off uh, contracted uh, gas and oil supplies to you uh, from Russia. And therefore, similarly, we will ask uh, contracted oil and gas supplies to China. That will be a test case. We don't know how it will pan out. But if uh, China stops buying uh, contracted oil and gas from Russia, keeps the renminbi reserves that uh, Russia keeps and makes it inoperable, uh, all Chinese banks refuse to deal all, not some, all Chinese banks refuse to deal with the Russian uh, system, uh, financial system. Russia does not help, uh, China does not help uh, uh, Russia in terms of its uh, big exports in the Far East, which is uh, marine, soya beans, uh, um, uh, some wheat exports about three, uh, three, three and a half billion. Uh, Russia would be in deep, very deep trouble, very, very deep trouble. It is unlikely that that will happen because the Chinese today will look for margins both with Russia and with the United States. Today is the turn for um, margin checking with uh, the US in Rome. Uh, we'll see where it, uh, where it pans out. Um, uh, the Americans, uh, understandably so, will see that all doors that are uh, being created to create pressure on Russia, um, Chinese will not give them a, uh, a safety valve. Let me end by saying a few things about India. Uh, I am in full support of the measures that uh, India has taken so far, uh, our votes and our um, uh, explanation of votes at the Security Council and other places. This is not a fight we have created. We, this is not a fight we are related to. This is a catastrophic failure, mismanagement, and miscalculation of relations amongst the big parts. The first rule of business is we should stop asking the big parts to pay for India to pay a cost for their mismanaged policies. We should say it upfront, we should say it clearly, and we should say it with the fact that we will not bear the cost of their policies. Number one. Number two, there are critical things that we need to learn about the weaponization of a networked world. What does global common mean? What does sanctions mean? What does secondary sanctions mean? What are reputational sanctions mean? You know, informal sanctions, but they scare, they scare you out of the uh, thing. Uh, what do downstream sanctions mean? Number one. Number two, this notion that uh, global commons, in, uh, rules-based international order, and uh, you know, uh, resilient supply chains. You know, what does resilient supply chain mean in the in this new world, where every aspect of global interdependence can be recognized unilaterally? Third. I think we should be careful on the differentiating between the fact that there is no trade embargo, but also be careful on the sort of um, uh, banking mechanisms that we will establish with Russia. You see, there is a certain section in our in our country that believes that internal international instability of the nature that we are seeing in Ukraine is a, you know, it's a bad dream. It's a, it's a nightmare, but in the morning it'll all go away. That the country, that the world will return to normal. You know, the nature of the conflict in Ukraine now dispels that notion once and for all. A single geo-economic system has been now being punctured by geopolitics. And it is fragmenting into three, four, uh, three, four groups. Some completely dominant by the dollar, some partially with the dollar, some non-dollar, some something else. But these are, you know, these are moving groups. And we should be present in every group. You know, we are a growing country. 
we have aspirations for ourselves we want to have the largest we have to have the connections with all the growth centers in the world they may be small large very large i mean it's like asking dhoni or uh, uh, kohli to bat only on the off side if you say that you will only deal with one part of the world you know where will the runs come you know the runs will come if we bat across all round the wicket we will take the singles we will take the sixes we will take the fours across you know front drive back drive snake leg launch everything we should have the freedom to do what is in our interest now sanctions will always come with um uh, at the ground level with organized crime to subvent sub 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 subvert sanctions and at a higher level lobbies who will give you exemptions you know we should be careful on how we play this game but where sanctions are not direct we should interpret those rules for our benefit and therefore i am absolutely delighted that the government has taken the view that if cheap russian oil is available on the high seas oil is a fungible commodity oil is flowing into europe that we would explore the possibilities of of protecting our interests I, i think that is an extremely good way to go 50% of the russian pharmaceutical market is is used by europeans the europeans are closing shop and going home we should be up front and say that we will take up and help uh, russia but also take up the market where we are equally good organic and inorganic chemicals automotive parts uh, uh, uh machinery tools you know the you know the list can go on for, you know for diamonds now from behalf of the government i think we need a clear perception that we should assess this new troubled world in our own interest we should also say that we should give confidence to our business community to to be courageous first of all uh, you know don't lose heart and uh, faith so quickly we are not interested in in, in transgressing sanctions but we should explore possibilities of uh, uh, promoting our own cultural uh, commercial interest because this is now going to be the new normal this is how the world is going to be the world if you wait for the world to come back to normal it's not going to happen the chinese will do their own deals uh, the europeans will do their own deals uh, the southeast asians will do their own deals and we should we have an advantage with russia on defense you see something that is not often noticed but in the last couple of years there had been in my view uh, i was there a genuine understanding on part of russia that to be there in the future indian market a strong make in india component is necessary it is no longer optional this current problems that we are having between russia and the west is an opportunity that in- should increase this moment we don't today have a plan even a plan to replace our t90 tanks t90 tanks will be with us until 2050 some spare part support for t90 tanks is inevitable what little spare parts we were getting from russia let us transfer those facilities to to india let us have a make in india component of spare parts now the legal political infrastructure has already been put nothing needs to be done it was it's already been done what we require is a little bit of hand holding uh, a a concerted push because the global circumstances have changed that actually make in india can actually rise because the it is not only good policy it is not only india's intention and lastly i think uh, we should resist the temptation to join the the group to ostracize russia we are not in the business of ostracizing anyone uh, we remember the people who didn't ostracize us the first famine of independent india was in 1951 we went with a begging bowl to the west to give us food grains 
it is stalin's russia uh, which gave us food grains in 1951 uh, similarly when no one gave us uh, fighter jets is the you know, mig 21s came to us or uh, you know let's not forget our pharma oil uh, steel industries but let's also not the russians forget that in 1996 we helped them out um, we helped them out with uh, Uh, the Sukhoi 30 deal, uh, which saved the the, uh, the Sukhoi industry. And let's also not forget that amongst the ambassadors who were inv invited to visit Kashmir after we in introduced Article 370, I was told in Moscow there is no need to invite the Russian ambassador because you don't need to convince us about your policy in Kashmir. India, Russia is fully with with uh, with, with India, and. on 370 we were told that it is not only india's right uh, uh, to have the 370 amendment but also it is constitutionally completely valid an internal matter of india russia has no questions so please don't ask us to join other ambassadors who have questions we are not in that group so we go a long way and we will have to go a long way this is a global confrontation that will take us well into several decades of the future no ostracism we don't believe in ostracization we we don't we we don't do that to others and we will not do do this to others especially with russia so on that uh, note uh, sir let me uh, stop i have been a little more than i should have spoken but uh, we happy to answer questions no venkat thank you very much uh, we welcome uh, your detailed uh, uh, presentation i think uh, you have uh, underlined 10 uh, key uh, trends and uh, there would be several uh, sub trends to each of those trends and that kind of covers the uh, state of the world uh, today and i think it's uh, very very useful the way you have uh, 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 analyzed the implications of this uh, conflict which is not just uh, a, a war but as you said uh, it's uh, for the most important uh, geopolitical a fundamental conflict that is uh, now overtaken the world and i think i uh, quite uh, enjoyed listening to your description of uh, how the world has moved uh, since uh, 1991 so you had uh, the unipolarity and then you had uh, uh, flirtations with multipolarity and now unipolarity polarity in some uh, uh, another way in which uh, europe is uh, a unipolar under us guidance uh, that is uh, coming back so i think uh, the west has uh, the west sees a chance now in uh, it did not it did not uh, accommodate russia in the 90s uh, putin it goes to the credit of putin that uh, he kind of rebuilt russia and uh, uh, posited a challenge uh, but whether this current uh, action of uh, putin Uh, whether uh, he will be able to sustain it, uh, and if he is unable to sustain it, then I think Russia will be further weakened, and that brings in uh, the uh, a new situation where uh, now uh, there could be new uh, uh, elements in uh, uh, China, uh, the West relations uh, with China and how China uh, utilizes these opportunities. I think uh, your uh, points about india are also uh, very well taken so that uh, india should act in its uh, national interest not uh, ostracize russia and at the same time see how uh, we can uh, exploit the opportunities which might come our way to strengthen our own uh, uh, you know self reliance uh, atmanirbhar programs and so on i think these are uh, uh, that's how uh, we should uh, look at it so thank you very much but uh, uh, your presentation was uh, extremely uh, clear uh, forceful and uh, there was no uh, hedging and hawing uh, on this so i think it's a very clear view that has emerged from your uh, presentation i'm sure there would be many uh, views and comments already i see the chat box is uh, flooded with uh, uh, the comments but i'll take them uh, uh, later but i am 